Hello everyone and welcome to USMLE Step 1 High Yield Images Part 3. Before I get started, I just want to thank everyone so much for those of you who have subscribed to my videos, watched my videos, and commented. Uh, I really appreciate the support and I'm glad to see that this is helping a lot of people. Uh, I got a few requests for things to be put into this video, so I tried to uh, include some of that. But as always, I kept the images pretty random because I feel like that's a good way to study. And of course, all the questions on the USMLE and Comlex are also random, so you want to be able to shift gears. So thank you for all of your support. Let's go ahead and get started. And a superficial hemangioma. Um, dermatology is a weak point for me, so I really uh, took some time to focus on this. Uh, so superficial hemangioma is also called a strawberry hemangioma. Uh, and you can see it right here. Um, the important things to know about this for exams are that it usually occurs in children um, and it's usually not present at birth, uh, but it occurs a little later after maybe a couple of weeks, a couple of months, that kind of thing. Um, so you see it here. It's basically just a collection of, of blood vessels that got tangled up. It's completely benign. Um, some other important things to know about this superficial or strawberry hemangioma, as you might see it called, is that like I said, it occurs in childhood, and it usually regresses. Um, it takes a couple years to regress. Uh, I've also seen a question that mentions the fact that this usually grows a bit before it starts to regress, so it gets bigger before it starts to get better. Um, that's one way to remember that. So it's not just going to shrink automatically. It'll grow a bit, and then it will regress. The next picture is an example of Janeway lesions, uh, and these are painless. Very important to know that they're painless erythematous lesions on the palms and soles. And this is another sign of infective endocarditis. I've showed several pictures of uh, physical findings with infective endocarditis now, so clearly it's an important thing to know. And there's a lot of different pictures that they can test you on uh, to suggest that that's the, the disease the patient has. This next image is an example of struvite crystals. Uh, these are kidney stones, you know, nephrolithiasis. Uh, another word for these, I believe, is ammonium magnesium phosphate crystals. So if you see that, don't get tripped up. It's the same thing. And they're described as having a coffin lid shape, which you can, you can see pretty well here. This looks pretty similar to a coffin lid. Uh, some important things to know about this are these struvite crystals or these struvite kidney stones are caused by urease positive bugs. So bugs that contain urease. Uh, the most important one being Proteus mirabilis. That's one of the, the big ones. And these are a cause of staghorn calculi, which maybe I'll include a picture of that in a future video. Staghorn calculi are really big kidney stones that essentially take up the entire shape of the renal pelvis. Uh, they can be extremely painful, and if they get big enough, they have to be removed by surgery. So if you see something like this, coffin lid shaped, you want to think about struvite crystals, proteus mirabilis, and staghorn calculi. This next image is an example of orphan anti-eye nuclei, and you can see them right here. Uh, this is seen in a condition called papillary thyroid carcinoma, which we've actually talked about before. I talked about it in my first video, I believe. Do you remember another, phys or another um, histological finding that you can see with papillary thyroid carcinoma? That's going to be somoma bodies. Somoma bodies. Remember, the P in somoma stands for papillary thyroid carcinoma. Uh, so the reason that they're called orphan anti nuclei is because they have this area of central clearing. I never knew this, so I googled it before. Uh, here's a picture. Uh, I guess this is from some show or comic or something, and I guess this is orphan Annie. To me, this is just uh, absolutely terrifying, but she has these completely clear eyes, and you can see the same thing in these uh, nuclei here. So if you see something like this, you want to be thinking about papillary thyroid carcinoma. And there she is again. This next one is a good look of Gautrin's papules. You see them here. These are basically uh, erythematous, rugged skin lesions that you'll see on the knuckles. You see them down the fingers here as well. Uh, and this is characteristically seen in what disease? Dermatomyositis. Dermatomyositis. So important things to know about that. Dermatomyositis can also present with a malar rash. You know, that butterfly rash on the face. 
So if you see that, I know it's usually a knee jerk for lupus, don't necessarily think about lupus. If the patient's having some really prominent muscle problems as well as these skin manifestations, you definitely want to be thinking about dermatomyositis. A couple other important points about dermatomyositis, some associated antibodies include anti-JO1, anti-SRP, and anti-MI2. So those are three important antibodies associated with dermatomyositis. The last thing is that this condition, dermatomyositis, has a strong association with lung, colon, and ovarian cancers. So if you see a patient that has something maybe suggestive of that, and they also have these kinds of skin manifestations, you want to be thinking about dermatomyositis. Very important. This next image um, is Cal Exner bodies, uh, and these are a sign of granulosa cell tumor of the ovary. Uh, these, I've seen them come up oftentimes uh, on a lot of different questions, uh, so they're definitely very important to know. The reason that they're called this is they have a kind of pseudo rosette pattern here, uh, and it looks like a primordial follicle. So it can be really hard to identify these when you have a giant histological slide of cells, but if you see something like this, you want to be thinking about a type of rosette. You know, if it's a female patient, kind of narrow it down, get your way to Cal Exner bodies, and get your way to granulosa cell tumor of the ovary. This next one is super important. You'll probably see this on step one, step two, even beyond. This is a um, histology slide of Whipple's disease. So super important, like I said, very high yield. And what you're looking at here is these enlarged foamy macrophages, which contain the a causative organism, which is what? It's Truferima whipplei. That is, that's the organism that causes Whipple's disease. Uh, and you will see these foamy macrophages in the lamina propria of the, the small intestine. Very important to know that. So if you see a slide like this, uh, you, you want to be thinking about the small intestine. You see these foamy macrophages here. You want to be thinking about Whipple's disease. Very important to know that and to know basically everything about this disease because it, you know, examinations uh, love to test this. This next one uh, is a little tough, but I thought it was really important to include. This is an example of a discoid rash. Uh, you can see it here. It's erythematous, a little erythematous, and it's also scaly. Uh, and this can be seen in lupus. There, are, It's a certain subtype of lupus, if I'm recalling correctly, um, but it can be seen in lupus. So if you see something like this, you know, don't get thrown off. I know a lot of people like to look for the malar rash, the butterfly rash on the face, and if you see something like this, maybe you're thinking more of, you know, cancer or something like that, but you still want to keep lupus on the differential, especially if they're having other systemic symptoms. Just because it's not a malar rash does not mean that it still can't be lupus. You know, you have something like this and it can be lupus. So don't get tripped up by that. This next one is an x-ray showing small bowel obstruction. Uh, and you can see it pretty clearly here that there's multiple air fluid levels right here, and it forms a kind of step ladder appearance. So big step going to smaller steps. You see something like this uh, in a patient complaining of abdominal pain, you know, they don't like to eat or something like that. You definitely want to be thinking about a small bowel obstruction. Uh, this next one is an example of retinal detachment. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is a computer generated image, but I still wanted to use it because I thought it, you know, got the point across pretty clearly. So on fundoscopic exam, if you see something like this, you want to be thinking retinal detachment. It presents as a kind of crinkling of the retinal tissue, which you can see up here. If you see any type of crinkling like this or some type of folding over that you can see here on the retina, you want to be thinking about retinal detachment. Uh, another thing that you can see, which you can't really see from this, uh, is changes in vessel directions. So if you see a vessel that normally goes straight, that all of a sudden starts to curve backwards or you know whirl around itself, you also want to be thinking about retinal detachment. This next one, the arrows uh, pointing to it there. This is an example of croup, uh, and what the arrow is pointing to is that steeple sign that you'll see on chest X-ray. You kind of see that triangular point there that looks like uh, the steeple of a church, and that's uh, usually a giveaway for croup. Uh, really important to know, another name for croup is called acute 
laryngotracheobronchitis. Do not get confused. If you see that big term on the exam, acute laryngobrachio, or excuse me, acute laryngotracheobronchitis, don't get confused. It's the same thing as croup. What's another common thing that they'll put in the vignette for croup is that seal bark kind of cough that a kid has, uh, and that'll also point you to croup. Also important to know that croup is caused by para-influenza viruses, so keep that in mind as well. This next one is an example of ash leaf spots. These are hypopigmented macules that are seen in tuberous sclerosis. Um, I know that, you know, this might kind of look like a couple other things. Someone might look at this and think that it's tinea versicolor, uh, but again, you want to get uh, some information from the question stem if they have other symptoms, you know, Tinea versicolor is usually pretty mild and they just have this skin condition. Uh, but if it's a genetic component or if the patient has a lot of other systemic conditions going on, you want to be thinking about ash leaf spots and tuberous sclerosis. This next one is an image of Zanker's diverticulum. So this is uh, basically an outpouching that occurs uh, in the pharynx uh, and it's seen on a barium swallow. So in the vignette, the patient will come in, uh, it's usually a, like a middle-aged man, they come in, they feel like they've had something stuck in their throat, you know, they don't want to eat very much, they have really bad breath because there's food in this uh, diverticulum here and it's starting to rot, so they have really bad breath. Uh, and you want to be thinking about Zanker's diverticulum, especially if you see something like this. Important to note that it is a false diverticulum. What's a good example of a true diverticulum? It's going to be Meckel's diverticulum, which I believe I've shown a picture of in the past. Um, so it's a false diverticulum. And also important to note that Zanker's diverticulum is caused by a cricopharyngeal motor dysfunction. I'll say that again. Zanker's diverticulum is caused by a cricopharyngeal motor dysfunction, which allows this herniation, this outpouching to occur. This next one... Um, a lot of people probably already know it just by looking at it. This is an example of monosodium urate crystals, and this is seen in gout. A lot of people might see this and just automatically think gout, but you need to know the name of the crystals as well. It's monosodium urate crystals. Important to know that they are negatively birefringent and they are needle-shaped, as opposed to pseudogout. And what's the appearance there? Uh, yeah, it's positively birefringent and it has more of a rhomboid or a diamond shape appearance in pseudo gout. This next one is an example of Putz Jaeger syndrome. Uh, so if you see a picture like this, it's almost like 99% a giveaway for Putz Jaeger syndrome. Uh, this is a, a disease of the GI tract where you'll have numerous hematomas that are occurring as well as hyperpigmented areas that you can see on the mouth, the lips, as you see here, the hands, and the genitalia. So if you see anything like this, almost a dead giveaway, you want to be thinking immediately about putz jaeger syndrome. This next one is an example of a heliotrope rash. So it's just a nice rash that you get around the orbital area here. And this is an example of what disease? Dermatomyositis. This is going to be dermatomyositis. What's another example? of a good uh, dermatologic finding in dermatomyositis that I showed, that's going to be Gautrin's papules. Gautrin's papules. So when you're thinking dermatomyositis, Gautrin's papules, heliotrope rash, also remember that there can be that malar butterfly rash with dermatomyositis. This one, the arrow's pointing to it there. This is a chest CT that's showing a saddle embolus. So you can see it, it's this darker area right here. Uh, and this saddle embolus is, uh, it gets caught in the pulmonary trunk in the big division of the pulmonary trunk. So you can see it's a pretty big embolus here that's getting caught. And to my understanding, this can cause death pretty quickly. So if this gets caught, obviously you're not getting any blood to the lungs. You're not gonna get any blood to the rest of the body. So this can kill you pretty quickly. Um, you will usually see this in older patients if you hear a vignette uh, of a younger patient that, you know, was running out on a field or something and they suddenly die, what do you want to be thinking about? Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That's the important thing. Young athlete that was playing a game, 
they suddenly collapsed and they died hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Something like this, older adult, saddle embolus. This uh, is an example of a string sign, which you would see on barium study, and this is associated with Crohn's disease. You see it right here, this nice string. When you swallow the barium, it's not able to get all the way through here. Uh, a lot of other associations with Crohn's disease, um, I, I'm pretty sure there's a, a nice big chart comparing Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis in first age, so definitely take a look at that, and, and uh, you should be good to go with that. This is the last picture, and this is an example of Osler nodes. Uh, these are painful raised red lesions on the pads of the fingers, as you can see here, and the toes. And this is a sign, once again, of infective endocarditis. So there's probably been five plus pictures now that I've shown of infective endocarditis. The important thing to note here is these Osler nodes are painful. Whereas the Janeway lesions, which are also on the hands and might trip you up, are painless. So you'll have to get that from the question stem. If it's painless, it's going to be a Janeway lesion. If it's painful, it's going to be an Osler node. And both are signs of infective endocarditis. I think in Pathoma, uh, they mentioned that Osler, ouch, ouch, Osler, that's what you want to be thinking about. Uh, and again, it's a sign of infective endocarditis. So that's going to be the end of this video. Once again, thank you everyone for all of your support, all of your suggestions. You know, please feel free to keep asking me for suggestions for future videos, that kind of thing. Uh, I hope to make another one in the future. Thank you so much and good luck studying.